Now we're going to specialize on periodic waves. They're a very special kind of wave in which the motion is repeated over and over again. We'll talk. Of, we'll give some mathematical rigor to this, and um, talk about speed of waves as they relate to the frequency in their wavelength. So first, defining a periodic wave. It's a pattern that is produced over and over again by a source. So if that, if your hand at the end of the slinky, creating a transverse wave is going up and down in a nice sinusoidal motion, that'll produce a periodic wave. Or you can do it in a jerky motion like this. As long as you do it over and over again, you get a periodic wave. So if the slinky moves in simple harmonic motion, like the first case that I talked about, my hand moving up and down, like we talked about uh, simple harmonic motion last semester, if it's moving up in a nice smooth sinusoidal pattern, then every point along the slinky will also vibrate in that same simple harmonic motion pattern. Um, and that, that's all a periodic wave is. It's, it's, it's where you're repeating the same motion over and over. And so let's think about now the wavelength and amplitude and other things for a, for a periodic wave. Now this uh, part of the figure here is a snapshot of a wave at a particular time. So imagine it being the slinky where I'm moving the end up and down, and then I take a snapshot with my camera, and I'll see this um, sinusoidal pattern, assuming I'm moving up and down in simple harmonic motion. What's the wavelength? The wavelength is denoted by the Greek letter lambda, and it is the distance between two identical points on the wave. Now, for example, here I've got the wavelength marked as a distance between this zero crossing and this zero crossing, where um, this zero crossing is identical to that zero crossing. This zero crossing is not identical to this one, because <laughs> in, in this case it's moving up, and in this case it's moving down. So it has to be two identical points on the wave, and that gives the wavelength between those two. Perfect. You can also uh, look at two crests, the distance between two crests, that also gives the wavelength. And, or two troughs to give the wavelength as well. Distance between two valleys in the wave or two peaks in the wave, two identical points on the wave give you the wavelength. Uh, it's the length of one cycle. It's measured in meters. And um, the period is the time required for one cycle of the wave. So now we're thinking back on, on the motion of your hand moving that slinky up and down. And, and asking how long it takes you go, to go from the top down to the bottom, back up to the top again. That's the period. It's exactly the same as the period that we talked about with simple harmonic motion. It's the time required for one complete cycle. And it's very similar to the period that we talked about for simple harmonic motion. If you remember from last semester, if you have an object that's moving in circular motion, uniform circular motion, the period is the time required for it to to make one complete revolution. So that's a period. It's measured in seconds. So I always remember that the period is measured in seconds. So I don't get confused with, with the frequency. What is the frequency? As we talked about last semester, it's one over the period. So if the period is the number of seconds per cycle, if we take one over that, then the frequency is going to be the number of cycles Per second. And that is the unit of the, the hertz that you'll remember from last semester. So that's what's shown here. This is um, what happens at a particular location. So we look at maybe the end of the slinky and we ask what the vertical position of that point on the slinky is as a function of the time. And it's going to oscillate back and forth. So this is a snapshot in space. And this is what happens at a particular point in space as a function of time. Now what's the, uh, the only thing left is the amplitude that we need to define. The amplitude is the maximum excursion of a particle 
from the particle's undisturbed position. So for example, this, this point right here in the wave, there's its undisturbed position. It's along the straight line. Here's its maximum excursion, its maximum displacement from its undisturbed position. And the amplitude is the distance between those two things right there. Well, we could look on the other side as well. Uh, if we look at this point here, down to this point here, the amplitude is also the distance between its undisturbed position and its maximum displacement. So how far is it from here to here, this entire distance? And you say, well, uh, yeah, it's twice the amplitude. So in fact, if you start, um, if you look at it as a function of time, the amplitude also applies here. If you look at um, during one complete period how far an object travels, it'll travel down to here. That'll be the amplitude, the distance of the amplitude. Down to here, remember we're, we're looking as a function of time, another amplitude. Back up to here, that'll be another amplitude. And then back up to here will be yet another amplitude. So during one cycle, each particle in the wave uh, travels a total distance of four times the amplitude. That's that. So what we're going to do is a, a simulation to demonstrate how these work. What I have here is a very nice set of simulations uh, from the University of Colorado of Boulder called the PHET, P -H -E -T, Physics Educational Software. So I'm grabbing the end of a, of a, of a string, or as you can think of it as a slinky, and watching how that wave propagates to the right. And um, I can try and replicate a periodic wave by trying to be as uniform as I can and going up and down. And you can see that I'm doing a pretty good job replicating this each time. If, um, if I want to get it perfect, then we just let the simulation software do it. And, and that's a nice, perfect, uh, uniform circular motion for this end of the slinky here that's producing a nice sinusoidal curve that propagates to the right. Um, and to understand the frequency and amplitude, let's try decreasing the amplitude. So that's a zero amplitude. So what's happening? Not moving at all. Here's a small amplitude. So its maximum, its excursion from its equilibrium position is small here. And here's a large amplitude. Well, what about frequency? What's its effect? If we increase the frequency, that means that we're going up and down faster. The period is smaller. The time it takes for one complete oscillation is less. Uh, and there the, therefore, the pre frequency is higher. Period is less, smaller. Frequency is one over the period, so it's larger. So this is a high frequency. This is a low frequency. Moving, moving slowly. And so frequency is really a measure of how fast it's, it's, it's going. The period is how long it takes for one complete oscillation. Okay. Uh, one more concept in this section, relate the speed of a periodic wave to its wavelength, period, and frequency. And this is a fun one, and it's reasonably straightforward to get. Here's the idea. If we have a train here, and we're thinking about each car of the train being one wavelength of, of the wave, and we also know the period which is the time required for one car to pass. Same thing hap happens in a wave. It's, the period is the time for one complete cycle. That's the time required for one wavelength of the, of the um, pattern to pass by you. So what this train does is in one period t, it travels a distance of one wavelength. 
And so if we want to know what the speed is, and that's what we do want to know, then it's going to be the distance traveled during one period divided by the time. Well, what's the distance traveled? Well, it's the wavelength. It goes one wavelength. And what's the time it, it, requ it required to travel one wavelength? Well, it's the period. So V is lambda over T. Don't memorize it just, well, you can memorize it if you want. It's so much easier just to think it through each time. The speed is distance divided by the time. Distance is the wavelength. Time is the period. And then to get to this point here, this is the more, um, the one that we'd use more often. V equals F lambda. How do we get here? Well, the lambda just comes along for the ride. Well, what about the F and where did it come from? Well, F is just 1 over the period. So the period here is in the denominator. We have 1 over the period, and that's just the frequency. So there you go. V equals F lambda. We'll use this relationship all semester. <laughs> we'll use it for mechanical waves and sound. We'll also use it for light waves, where we'll replace uh, this speed of the wave with the speed of light. So the wavelength, again, uh, measured in meters, a period measured in seconds, free frequency measured in hertz, and therefore, uh, since the speed is a distance over a time, its units are meters per second. A uh, quick example, AM and FM radio waves are transverse waves that have electric and magnetic field disturbances, and we'll talk about those in later chapters this semester to understand these uh, radio waves. And they travel, as it turns out, at the same speed that light travels, the speed of light. And um, so if we're interested in finding the distance between adjacent crests in each wave, and what is that distance called? There's a name for it. It's called wavelength. So we know that V equals F lambda. If we're interested in the wavelength, and to find it, we're going to divide both sides of the equation by F. And we get that the wavelength, therefore, the F's cancel on this side. And the wavelength is V over F. So that's this equation right here. V is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And then the frequency for that 12.30 a.m., is 1230 kilohertz. Kilo is 10 to the 3, so the AM band is, um, is in the kilohertz range. 1230 times 10 to the 3. And so that wavelength is 244 meters. How far is that? Well, the football field is 100 yards, that's about 100 meters, so we're talking about two and a half football fields is the wavelength of that AM station. Pretty neat, I think. Uh, what about FM? FM stations, 91.9, this is Utah Public Radio's uh, frequency, sponsored by, by uh, here at USU. Uh, there's a relationship between UPR and, and Utah State University. It's in the megahertz range, so times 10 to the 6 hertz, much higher frequency. Well, if you put that higher frequency in the denominator, then what you end up with is a smaller wavelength, so about 3 meters. Um, just three, about three yards, about the width of this room or so. And that's section two.